welcome to the 20th episode of It Wasn't Me, a true crime podcast where we talk about murders that intrigue us. I am Cindy. And I'm Mercedes. This week's episode is about a sadistic murderer from a seemingly well-adjusted family in Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you for listening to last week's episode where we covered a murder for hire set in motion by catfishing psycho from Indiana who promised millions to an equally psycho woman in Alaska. Fair warning, our show can be extremely horrifying and graphic, and we will use offensive language. So if you have kids, put them away for a while and join us for a murder. Also, be forewarned, we are passionate and always have been about true crime, but sometimes we're going to make jokes and laugh during our podcast. For more information and links to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages, visit our website at itwasn'tmetruecrime.com. Subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, and please give us a five-star rating. While you're there, leave us a comment telling us which murder intrigues you. And if you'd like our show, please consider supporting us through patreon.com forward slash it wasn't me pod. We appreciate our Patreon supporters more than words can express. Thank you so very much. Mercedes, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm fantastic. How are you? Tired. Yeah, I'm kind of tired today too, but I don't have a good reason like you do. Yes. So I only work one job. <laughs> of course, I did just move, which is tiring in itself. So yeah. Yes, which is probably, and it's not like my second job is really difficult. Yeah. I'm just... It's just a lot of hours. And then you're, you know, a mom and you work full-time job. Anyway, did you get to watch The Pharmacist yet? No, but I have a funny story. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, anyway. So there's a pain management doctor, you know, in our town. Okay. There's several. Uh, well, one got raided by the DEA and the FBI. Yeah, do we know why? No, they never tell anybody why. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So they'll probably change their name like the other guy in town who got raided. Oh. He changed his name. Okay. Anyway, um, so I was reading the Facebook comments to the newspaper article, the news, whatever they, you know, and every idiot alive is allowed to just post whatever they want there. But right. I saw the funniest comment ever, and it said, well, maybe, maybe the pharmacist from Louisiana should investigate and find out what's going on. Oh, yeah. And I thought it was hilarious. Other people were like, what are you talking about? But but we had just talked about that last yes. week. Yeah. Well, you have to see it if you haven't. You I know. know. I need to watch it, but I'm so tired. Uh, but Yeah, it's good. Yes. It's and, good. And this week's episode happens to involve the ph- involve a pharmacist. Really? Yes. Uh. I mean, loosely. But okay. Yes. So we're on our, for- our pharmacist binge then, right? Yes. All yes. right. Should we get into murder? Yes. But I also want to out it's our 20th episode i know it's going by fast listen it feels like i don't know it doesn't feel like 20 but it feels like we've been doing this for a while and i'm quite proud of what we've accomplished so far me too me too so we've we're getting some good feedback yeah and i think we're still dealing with a little bit of sound issues but we have a dedicated studio now that we're trying to fix up so hey if you have any um critiques we would love to hear, you know, give us some feedback on how we're doing, what we could do to do better. Yes. We certainly would appreciate it. Yes. All right. So right into Stephen Howard Oaken. 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 Okay. He's from Baltimore, Maryland. Oh. Yes. So he was born on January 22nd, 1962. And he was actually adopted right at birth, like a couple of days old by a Jewish family, which would come up later. So. Right. And they were a seemingly very stable, good family in town. Well known. Everybody knew them. Nothing crazy going on here. All right. So um, they actually uh, grew up in Randall's town, which I'm assuming is not far from like Baltimore so, yeah. County. It's in Baltimore I, County. I'm wondering if they call it Randallston or something. You know, because I'm usually sure. when you have that town at the end, they, they shorten it. Randallston. Yeah. There's a couple of towns around us with the town. But we are in the South. Yes. Further South than Maryland. Maryland. Even well, though Maryland is below the Mason Dixon line. And they consider themselves, well, most of them Maryland. I don't know about Baltimore, but a lot of Maryland consider, considers themselves Southern. Oh. Yes, they do. <laughs> but they are technically below the Mason Dixon line. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, the Oaken family was, they were of Jewish faith, but they didn't really strictly, they weren't strictly observant, but they did send their kids 
to synagogue on high holy days. Um, so, you know, um, one of my, I'm sorry for interrupting, but one of my very good friends, actually one of my best friends is Jewish and um, she was raised, her husband's also Jewish and she was raised as reformed Jew. So it was kind of like, I mean, they still went to synagogue and stuff once a week, but they weren't as observant as her husband who was kind of like the middle level. I mean, I can't remember what they call. Is that kind that. of like going to a contemporary it, service? Yes. I mean, I think it's kind of like, and then the, you know, the ones that wear the curls on their hair and the, mm-hmm. like those That's are orthodox. Orthodox. Right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So um, her husband's like right in the middle. So he still would wear the yarmulke and um, observe, like do a lot of the observation, like observe a lot of the customs and traditions, like, like kosher and... Well, she's even kosher, too. Okay. But they don't have... I don't know if they have their own kitchen, like, a separate kitchen. You know, like okay. some of the more observant ones do. So, yes. yeah. It's very interesting. I always ask her all my Jewish questions. <laughs> yes. I, yes, yes. All right. And I don't know anyone super close to me that is Jewish. I mean, apparently, like I said earlier, I did my DNA. Right. And... What, what was Ashkenazi? Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi yes. Jew, yes. Mm-hmm. So I have a very small... 2%, two percent, right? Two percent. Yeah. yeah like I'm 2% Senegalese. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So Stephen played several sports, was on the lacrosse team at his local high school. He studied briefly. I mean, he almost graduated. He studied for three years at the University of Maryland, but withdrew just a few credits shy of a health science degree. Um, he also... When he was around 10 or 11, his parents actually told him about his adoption, and he went ballistic. I wonder why they told him. I don't know. Maybe they just found, like, it was time to tell him. Huh. You know, sometimes kids, like, snoop around that age. Like, they'll snoop and see their birth certificate and go, hmm, who is this? I mean, who knows? But that would be just weird to randomly just tell your kid when they're 10 or 11 that they're adopted. Right. And he did not take it well at all. So um, they said that his mom would later testify that he would that he screamed in disbelief for two hours. So, yeah. So, hey, let's go out and murder someone because I'm adopted. Right. Right. I mean, maybe they thought, you know, we want him to know because if he found out later, maybe he'd be pissed off. Because I do know someone that found out when he was 18 that his dad was not that his dad was his adoptive father. And he was completely pissed off and very upset where I have an adoptive father, but I have known, I've always known. Right. I mean, if I, and I mean, he adopted me when I was like three years old. So if they would have never talked about it again, I would not, I don't have any recollection of any time before that. So, but I've just always known and my, my mom never hid that from me, you know, so be it. All right. I wasn't upset. I don't have issues over it because I had a great dad. This guy had a great dad too. But he had issues. So as he grew up into a young man, he would begin working with his dad at their business. And I did read later that he actually owned part of the business also. So, and it was called Oaken's Rexall Pharmacy. Am I, do you think I'm saying that correctly? I think it's Rexall. Rexall. Rexall Pharmacy. I think they have some of those in Virginia. Like, I think it's like a chain kind of. um, Franchise? It is, yes. Okay. All right. So this is where Stephen would actually meet his wife, Phyllis. Okay. When Stephen was around 24 years old, he started showing signs of trouble, though. Um, Around 1986, Stephen would start running from a lot of things. So I don't know if, like, the whole issue of the, you know, feeling abandonment, you know, oh, my parents didn't love me, they abandoned me, or my mom. So wait, was he married by the time he was 24? Or do we, what, what year did he get married, do we know? I do not know. Because I did not look. Okay. So we don't know if he's married in 1986 or not. But, like, he was running from a lot of his problems. Like, emotional things? problems. and Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it turns out to be that he kind of has an addictive personality. So he starts some substance abuse, alcohol, pills, that sort of thing. So he's kind of escaping from the feeling. He's probably got depression. He's probably feeling abandoned, even though he didn't know the mom that put him up for adoption. That's always, like, in the back of his mind. Well, my mom didn't love me, so she gave me up for adoption. And I've said this before. I'll say it again. That might have been the best thing for him. Right. Because you know, later on, he yeah. said that he tried to find his birth mother, and there was no... He, there, he was unsuccessful in finding her. And maybe 
she, I mean, that's why people give kids up for adoption. Because they, they aren't equipped to be able to be a parent. Right, yeah. And there are lots of people out there who can't have their own. Kids. Yeah, and a friend of mine has children. She's got she adopted two children from the same mother, and the mother was had gone to prison both times. So she, both children were born in prison, and um, she wanted my friend to adopt both kids. So it was it was good for her. So her children are actually um, birth siblings i guess awesome that they weren't separated right and but i don't know the mother i don't know if the mother's still in prison or not but the mother's never like tried to contact them or anything right. i or, actually have a friend who adopted like six kids from the same family i'm wondering if i know that same family you but that's okay do. all right <laughs> you probably do he's in our line of work <laughs> okay yeah i know who it is i think but yes we'll talk later and he's a great guy but i mean and him and his wife didn't have any kids and they adopted all of these kids they like and said that they didn't want them. And they were foster parents before that, right? Maybe. If it's the same family they were. But, but briefly. Like, okay. they immediately decided they were going to adopt these kids. Okay. Which is amazing. All right. So, because of his issues, he started abusing cocaine, marijuana, God forbid, uh, prescription medication, and even alcohol. And, you know, all of that combined is not a good combination. Because we've talked about the psychosis that can come from all of that. Just mixed together and just how it affects different people. Well, Stephen's father went as far as telling him that you got to get this under control or you can't continue to work here at this pharmacy. Huh. Even though he was part owner at least mm-hmm. as a pharmacy technician. Nowadays, I wonder if they make those people go through like drug tests like every now and then. Probably. Um, another pharmacy. Did you see where... The pharmacist at our local at our yes. local Publix was arrested. Yes, and I found out what, what happened. Was, with that. He was, he was yeah. okay. So like, if you drop medication on the floor, you have to discard it. Okay, makes sense. But he wasn't. So he was dis, He was saying he was dropping narcotics on the floor, but then hello, it's Publix. They, you know, they're not just they have measures to verify this information and it just wasn't coming back right they were like well you said you dropped 100 pills last week well we only have 10 i'm not saying that that's the number but it just got to be where actually Publix is oops i dropped a pill yeah (laughs) oops i dropped another one (laughs) i can't believe i did that but Publix is actually the one who ended up calling the sheriff's department and turning him in God, that's all. I mean, that's a career ruiner there. I mean, oh, gosh, I yes. mean, you know, if you're a drug addict or you're selling them, that's one thing. But if it's a stupid mistake, that's that's yeah, another. I'm sure I it's something serious. Yeah. Them. Or he was giving them or selling to, them to someone who was selling them or giving them. Or oh, right. Or them. taking them himself, too. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Know. OK. But that was the whole the whole deal. So, yes, his father was like, look, you can't work here if you're a drug addict, because maybe, you know, like I said, they were like, um, Known in the town. So people might have been like, um, yeah, that pharmacist tech is a freaking crackhead. I ain't going there. But, you know. Or. Not a big yeah. crackhead at the time. Right. <laughs> All right. So Stephen would eventually start to see a, psycho- a psychiatrist off and on for about a year or so. But in the fall of 1987, he began getting into trouble with the law. So according to police and court records, um, Stephen was arrested and charged on October 13th, 1987 for beating up a motel clerk in East Baltimore. A week later, he would attack a prostitute in a parking lot after um, he refused to pay her in advance for her service. Oh, Lord, how embarrassing. If he was married at the time, that is embarrassing he for the wife. At this time. Okay. So he was married at this time. And East Baltimore, yeah, I don't think that's a place that you want to hang out. I'm not super positive about East Baltimore, but. Uh, Baltimore is, is a pretty scary place in some areas for sure. Okay. Have you watched The Wire? I started watching it. Yeah. It's a little too, uh, I don't know, boring for me. Really? Oh, I watched it all. I I don't know. Like my family, my family watched it all and I started watching it. But you know, after three or four episodes of something, I'm like, yeah, nah, I can't. I, if it's more than three or four episodes, I, yeah, it's like, nah. Well, I watched the whole thing, and if it is an accurate portrayal of Baltimore, which I know that the city came out was trying to say that, you know, you're portraying us as like we're a bunch of gangbangers, and well, there are parts, a pockets of a city that are bad, and not all right. of Baltimore is not bad because I've been to Baltimore. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, there's an airport there. There are a lot of things to do there. There's um, part of the National Archives are in Baltimore. So there are there are good parts of Baltimore, but there are also um, a lot of places that are not safe and right. drug affi- afflicted and, and whatnot. So, My yeah. My parents were married right in Maryland, right outside of D.C., so somewhere in this uh-huh. area. Yeah. And, um, gee, I sure wish I was going to the National Archives this year. Mm-hmm. Well. Hmm. <laughs> That's for a different day. All right. So, um... So he were he he beat up a prostitute. Yes. Because okay. I guess she got pissed off that he wasn't going to pay. And she called dance. the cops. Yeah, he beat her up. So oh well, he beat me up because um he wouldn't pay me. He ass. wouldn't pay me. So I mean, yeah, a lot of prostitutes wouldn't call the police on that. No, of course, that's like but you know, she might have been yeah, severely injured. Yeah, so it was enough for her. It was enough for him to get in trouble with the okay. law. Okay. All right. So um. So on the evening. You know, not even a month later, on the evening of November 1st, 1987, he would pose as a stranded motorist and a doctor. I read that he was going, like, door-to-door of this apartment complex called White March Apartments. And he was saying, I'm a doctor, Um, my pager went off, and I can't... um, I I need I need to call in because my pager's going off. My car broke down. But there did was... you just say my Peter's going off? <laughs> <laughs> my Peter or my pager? <laughs> oh, maybe both of them. His Peter was definitely going off. Okay, sorry. But, as we'll later find out. But <laughs> pager beeper. I bet I said Peter because I was trying to say pager. Okay. And <laughs> I'm like, wait, did she just say Peter? <laughs> I'm so sorry. All right, so later testimony would reveal that he um, he knocked on the door of a Don Marie Garvin. So that was on November 1st. So a couple weeks later, on November 9th, he actually received probation for the motel, clerk, the motel clerk's assault and ordered to seek alcohol treatment. Then, just a couple of weeks later, he would um, be arrested for driving while intoxicated. It's like everything's happening all at once. Like, he's... Uh, yeah. And he was, you know. It's it's definitely, what do you call that? Unorganized, spontaneous. I don't know. I call reckless. it spiraling out of control. Yes. Good. Because good. we're yeah. going to find out. Let's backtrack to November 1st. Okay. And, um, and this is kind of like maybe why he was driving intoxicated. Or, you know, he was just fucked up. He was just a fucked up individual at this time. And let's reveal why. Even more so. Okay. So Dawn Marie Garvin was 20 years old. On Sunday, November 1987, um, her husband, Keith, arrived at the U.S. Naval Base in Ocean, Virginia. Osha? Oceana. Oceana, Virginia. Well, that's not how I was spelled. Oceana. I know. But that's how it's spelled. <laughs> okay. All right. Oceana, Virginia. Um, he had just returned from a weekend visit with his new wife, Dawn. So I guess he was stationed there or he was staying there. I'm not... I'm not really sure why he was going back to the base after just a weekend leave, but I know that when my cousin was activated after um, 9-11, mm-hmm. he actually was with the Alabama National Guard, and they activated him, and even though he lived within, like, 30 minutes of the base, they made him stay on yeah. base. So when, when my husband was activated with the Marine Corps Reserves, yeah, they just took him. <laughs> well, I think, you know, like my son, when he first got married, he was still on the base. Um, but he also would like, you know, spend the night at his girlfriend's house, his current wife. So when they got married, he still was um, living. He was still considered to be living on the base. So because of a certain rank, you have to live on base, right? Yeah. And then you have to like do this paperwork to get, you know, then you get your your housing allowance and whatnot. But. I, I do know that when he first got married to her, he was still living on the base. So, there's a process. so, and then like on nights that he had guard duty or whatever, he actually had to stay on the base. So he couldn't okay. go home. Right. So who knows? It could be anything like that. All right. All right. So Keith arrived safely back to the base and um, he called his wife to let her know. But unfortunately, he was unable to reach her. And after several attempts to try and contact her, he eventually became very worried because he was like, I just left her. I don't live that far. So he called his father-in-law, uh, Frederick Joseph uh, Romano. Mr. Romano lived very close by, and he asked, um, and Keith asked him to go check on Dawn. All right, Romano um, agreed to check on his daughter. Uh, he called twice, 
and both calls went unanswered. So due to the lack of contact, Romano decided to drive her to the apartment at the request of her husband. I did also read somewhere else where he stopped by maybe his other daughter's house before that. And I think maybe that's, maybe he tried to call her again. And then, so then he drove her to the apartment. He found the apartment door ajar. And every time I see that word ajar, I hear my husband going, the door's ajar, the door's ajar. Sorry, I just had to put that in there. Anyway, <laughs> when he arrived. <laughs> Sounds like a parrot. The door's the ajar. The door's ajar. You know, like a, like an automated, like, car. The door's oh. ajar. The door's ajar. Anyway, so when he arrived and uh, the door was ajar and all of the apartment lights were turned on and the TV was blaring. Okay, so wait a minute. He gets to his daughter's house. The door is open. open. Okay, so a jar can be wide open. It can be slightly open. Yeah. All the lights are on. The TV's blaring. Do we know what time of day this is? It's the middle of the night. It's around midnight. And and this is an apartment complex. So right. no one uh, noticed this. Thank you. That's what I was thinking. I was like, no one was like, turn that shit down. Because that's how I, mean, I would have been like that. All right. So he rushed into the apartment because he was like, this isn't right. And unfortunately, he would find his daughter nude on her bed with a bottle protruding from her vagina. Oh, Jesus. That's uh, not, I mean, you don't want to find your daughter dead. I know. But all I can ask is what kind of bottle hot sauce holy shit hot sauce Here's a hot sauce bottle like tabasco <laughs> no. i'm so sorry Durkies. and i only know what Durkies is is because they make other stuff and my husband likes it on this so was the oh my god i have so many questions um okay so that is uh totally what is that when you when you humiliate like a, it's it starts with a D, the word I'm looking for. But my question is, is, was the bottle open? I don't, <laughs> I mean, okay, I mean, I'm so sorry later, for laughing. This so is disgusting. And, I, later, and it's awful for the woman. He describes exactly what happened. Okay. All right. And from what I can, like, what I'm, from his statements, I don't think the bottle was open. Okay. I hope it wasn't because that would burn like hell. Well, if you're dead, it's Jesus. not going to burn you. Oh, well. Okay. I just gave a little bit away. All right. Okay. So, again, I can't imi- imagine finding my daughter dead, but I really can't imagine my I mean, husband finding my daughter in that not state. Not your husband. Your but... Yeah, your husband finding your daughter like yeah. that. Okay. I mean, he's going to have that image forever. What is the word I'm coming from? I'm come. Oh, Lord, I'm going to come up with that word. Okay. All right. Well, when you, when you just... I'm just going to shout it out. Just shout it out, it. yeah. Okay. It, I mean, it may be 2 o'clock in the morning when you're It's not it. defacing the body, but degrading. Defiling? defiling? That's a good word. Maybe that's the word. Yeah. Okay. She, he, she definitely was defiled. Yes. Okay. All right. So Romano immediately started CPR on his daughter and called for medical assistance. It was at this time that he noticed his daughter had blood streaming from her forehead. EMS arrived, took over CBR, CPR, but their efforts were in vain. Dawn Marie Garvin was dead at 20 years old. Oh, my God. She was a baby. And she was a newlywed. I mean, her whole life was in front of her. Yeah. I can't imagine how terrified she must have been also. So when police arrived at the apartment around 2.30 a.m., upon inspection of the scene, they did see um, some signs of forced entry. Once inside, detectives saw a brassiere. So this is a brassiere. Um, They found a brassiere, a pair of pants, tennis shoes, and a shirt. And a sweater on the floor near the sofa in the living room. The bra was not unhooked, but instead was ripped on one side and the pants were inside out. So it's like he just ripped, like ripped it off of her. Yeah. Very violent. So police would find a small piece of rubber on the floor near the TV, um, which turns out later to be. Like a condom? No. mm -mm. Okay. Um, They would also find two separate 25 caliber shell casings on the bed with one being on top of the bloodstained shirt with what appeared to be a bullet hole in it. An autopsy would reveal that Dawn died as a result of two contact gunshot wounds, one entered at her left eyebrow and the other at her ear. At trial, um, Oaken's own expert reveals the details of this murder. So he actually... Now, we're kind of jumping ahead here, but he actually talks to, like, someone about the crime, right? Yes. And this is actually, I'm going to go ahead and talk about, give the details now because it's pertinent to the murder scene. But it is a testimony that's given by the defense experts at his sentencing. Okay. All right. 
So and Because I, it just seems odd to me that if he's for the defense, but if he's ordered to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and right. that's what he needs to tell, right? right. And this okay. was on cross-examination. So I'm just going to okay. read verbatim what was said. It says um, that his own expert during cross-examination of the sentencing phase said, I was told by Mr. Oaken that he approached the victim outside the apartment, asked if he could use the phone, made his way into her apartment, looked about, shut the door, took out a gun, and asked that she get undressed. He asked her to begin masturbating, then he masturbated. At the same time, he then asked her to get up and perform oral sex on him. Then he pushed her back. He got on top of her, and he tried to have intercourse. He did this in, a, in different positions, including anal. He got up at some point, went into the kitchen, brought back a bottle of Durkee's hot sauce, which he, said, which he said he inserted into her vagina. He made her take the bottle in and out. He was masturbating at the same time. He became angry because he couldn't reach climax, and then he killed her. End quote. Okay, so, um, yeah, he's... I have a question. So what what that man just testified to did not really match the evidence, right? Well, because her them. house her house was had there were signs of forced entry. And yes. her clothes were ripped off. So if he's yes. saying that she took her clothes off when he told her to, that doesn't match the evidence. No, and I think that he probably said take your clothes off and maybe he Maybe she he helped her a fast. little, yeah. right? Yeah, she wasn't moving fast okay. enough, so he helped her a little. Um, yeah, he's a sick puppy, and I've actually read where people get so excited, like nothing doesn't mean how matter how extreme the um, sexual position is or the sexual act, like it's just not enough. That is, I mean, that I think that's like a sign of sexual addiction or something, isn't it? I mean, yes. that's fucking sick. Yes. Okay. Yeah. He's a real son of a I mean, bitch. leave it to you to come up with these sick ones. <laughs> okay. Sorry. No, it's okay. All right. So, that wasn't the only. That okay. The so, only so now they don't know who this is, right? They don't no. know who the murderer is or anything like that. They're Not doing an investigation. Mm-hmm. Not a clue. Okay. So, a couple weeks later, you know, what, two weeks later, on November 15th, um, Patri- Patricia Hurt went to her brother-in-law's house, who is Stephen Aiken. This is his wife. Stephen, Stephen Oaken, right? Oaken, excuse me. Okay. This is, his Steve, this is his wife's sister. She goes to the house to return a camera that she borrowed to take photographs of her daughter's graduation. Um, so Miss Hurt's sister, Phyllis, was away on a business trip. So his wife is away on a business trip, and his sister comes over to return a camera that she borrowed. Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, but she found a note on the front door that said, that was from her brother-in-law, Stephen, that said, Pat, come in. I'm in the shower. Of course, she went on in. Right. Right? I mean, why wouldn't she? So, she has no, no feeling at all about this creepy dude at all. No. None. All right. So, once she entered the house, um, she was attacked by her brother-in-law. Um, he ripped her clothes off, raped her, and beat her so severely that he knocked out one of her teeth and left blood spatter throughout the house i mean so this was this was a vicious beating Mm. all right after the assault he strangled patricia shot her in the head with a 38 caliber handgun and drove her car into a drainage ditch ditch off a white marsh boulevard um where he dumped her body so you'll see here white marsh apartments is where the Ah. first is and so this is White Marsh. So Boulevard. not far. And it's similar sexual beatings. Oh, okay. Yes. I, am I getting ahead here? Yep. You're okay. Good. Okay. All right. So he apparently placed one of her tennis shoes on her body. And then the other one was found at his house. So I don't know if he like tried to bring his stuff with her. And then oh, yeah. He, he, he yeah, that's an accident. Now that, that was a mistake that he did not intentionally mean to do. Okay. I'm sure of that. Because he's a freaking idiot. Yeah. So, um. The, uh, the other one was found at his house when police searched after Mrs. Hurt, Patricia, after her father reported her missing. So um, after this took place, he actually stole her car, which was like a 1979 white Mustang. So he drives it into a drainage ditch and then gets it out of the ditch? Yeah. I guess he drives it close enough to dump her and then okay. he just backs so out. So maybe he doesn't drive it in the ditch, maybe just near it. Right. 
So he fled to Maine at this point in his sister-in-law's car. In an attempt to throw police off his tracks, he left a note for his wife that read, I killed your sister. Now I kill your husband. Oh. Yeah. All right. Around this time, Patricia Hurt's father, like I said, had reported her missing. So because he reported her missing, the police were kind of snooping around, and then they were able they actually found her body on November 16th. Her nude body was found in a ditch along the White Marsh Boulevard. She had been sexually assaulted, shot in the head, and strangled, as I've already stated. So after the missing report, report missing persons report was filed by her dad, and her body was discovered, the police made a connection between Hurt and Garvin. Because um, Hurt's body was found so close to the scene of the 20-year-old um, Garvin, police suspected he just, they just, I guess they just put two and two together. They well, knew, yeah. They probably, the dad probably knew where she had been. But, you know, when you have two young women um, sexually assaulted and, and murdered in similar fashion because they were both shot, right? Yes. Um, yeah, you're going to make a connection. Mm-hmm. And later there were witnesses who could testify that he was knocking on doors saying, hey, I am uh, a doctor. My pager went off. I need this. So there is testimony to that later. Uh-huh. Those people claim that he seemed to be intoxicated at the oh, time. Oh, interesting. And so the father and reported her missing. Yeah. And and it had to be odd. You know, my daughter went to the, my father, my son-in-law's house and never returned. And now he's not answering the phone and he's not home. Correct. So, yeah, I mean, they're going to make a connection. Right. I, I mean, if they didn't, they would not be very good policemen. No, no. So he flees to an area in Maine called Kittery, excuse me, Kittery, and then he checks into the Coachman Motor Inn using his real name and his real address. So while he was there, he wasn't there very long before all hell breaks loose there, too. Now, now did, what, I'm sorry, but you, you said that they go to his house. Did they find anything there at his house? Eventually, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So once in Maine, he checks into this coder, coder, <laughs> coach men motor in. Okay. Only a few hours later after checking in, he sexually assaults and murders the hotel clerk. Jesus, this dude is insatiable. Yes. This poor Lori Ward, she was just 25 years old. And so he kills her and then he steals $300 from the cash register. So he killed the motor, the motel clerk in the same manner in which he murdered the two in Maryland. Um, her body was found by a maintenance worker, and she had been sexually assaulted and, and shot as well. So, he was very familiar with this area due to vacationing there, and he drove 65 miles north to a Freeport Inn in the coastal town of Freeport, Maine. The hotel manager had already heard the news reports of the murder in Kittery, and he decided that this guy fit the description, the car fit the description, and he notified the authorities. And more than 20 officers and tactical teams surrounded the motel. He, it didn't take long. He didn't put much of a fight up. So after speaking with police negotiators for just a few minutes, he said, okay, I'm going to come out. Don't shoot. And then he exited room 215. Coward. Mm-hmm. So, and he surrendered peacefully to the, um, I almost said Marine, <laughs> to the Maine State Police. When police entered the hotel room, they found an AR-15, a 38 automatic pistol, the one that was used to kill Hurt and Ward, in the bloodstained car. The gun was speckled with Hurt's dried blood. Wow. Mm. So he got that gun super close, that there's a blood spatter on it. Yes. Like execution style close. Jesus. Police also discovered several things in room 215 in the Freeport Inn. Wads of cash, which I assume was from... The previous motel where he stole the $300. A bloodstained surgeon smock. A half-empty bottle of vodka. And two pieces of nylon cord. Wait, what the hell's up with this bloodstained surgeon smock? I'm thinking that's probably like a scrubs. Yeah, and but... maybe that's what he had on. To well, if he's know. pretending he's a doctor. I mm-hmm. don't know. That's odd. Yeah. So, he told police that he had a bad drug problem and that he couldn't remember anything from the last 24 hours. Likely story. Right. So then he faces charges in Maine and Maryland, which is not good. So because, um, as we discussed earlier, because he was arrested in Maine, they get to, you know, they get first shot at him. Right. All right. So on June 23rd, 1989, Stephen Howard Oaken was sentenced to life in prison in Maine for first degree murder, for the first degree murder of Lori Elizabeth Ward. He was also convicted of theft and the robbery of Lori. 
Oaken was slapped with a life sentence without the possibility of parole, along with 20 years for the robbery and an added five years on the theft charge with all charges to run concurrently. Okay, so life and then uh, 20 plus, yeah. Five. So, well, yeah. I wonder if they have parole in Maine. I know Virginia doesn't, but yeah, okay. What? Well, you know, and he's not going to get that opportunity. So, um, a main, the Maine police chief actually testifies later saying this poor girl was working her way through school putting herself through college. She went to the University of New Hampshire and planned to actually quit her job at the Coachman after Christmas to concentrate <sighs> on getting her um, veterinarian degree. After her murder, her family dog even stopped eating and died. Oh. Yeah, she just had like a, a touch. I mean, it takes a special person to work with animals anyway. Um, that's not something you just stumble upon, you, you know, in a career that you just happen yeah. upon. It's a calling. Listen, my dogs won't eat when we're when we go out of town or whatever. Like yeah. what? Yeah, it's so sad. I know. All right. So her um her sister also stated that she had a love for animals and wanted to share that love with small children. So when asked about Oaken, this same police chief said that he had checked into the motel a couple of hours later. He murdered her. He is also quoted as saying, "I have no doubt that he would have murdered again if we hadn't caught him." Strong said that Oaken's punishment is suitable for the crimes that he committed. He also said, I've never in my law enforcement career seen a person who deserves the death penalty more than this individual. I'm just glad that they have the death penalty in Maryland. Oh, so now he's going to go to trial in Maryland for the other two ladies, right? That is correct. All right. And this this um, police chief actually testified in both trials. Well, Right, because he would have to because they had evidence in the car from the murder. Yes, and he's the one who actually went in and found all of this information. So Strong was the one who found the bloody pieces of evidence strewn across the coachman motor end that linked Oaken to all three murders. So after his conviction in Maine, he was brought back to the state of Maryland where he faced charges for the other two homicides. He was charged with first-degree murder of Dawn along with burglary, sexual offenses, robbery, daytime housebreaking, which was a first charge, a charge I've never heard of before. So he, so he did this in the daytime. Well, I mean, if he, if there was, if there was evidence, the daytime, but, but maybe that's, listen, if there was evidence that it was a forced entry, you know, maybe he broke into the house earlier. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Who knows? Because they said that, um, I read that, she had actually been out walking her dog. So, and then that's when he, I guess, followed her and approached her. <laughs> Bless <Excuse> you. <laughs> All right. Um, so, also, he was charged with handgun violence and theft. So, he has a whole slew of charges just for the Don Garvin. That we're not even talked about his sister in law yet. All right. So, the state of Maryland had concrete concrete evidence against him and the state had the murder weapon that was going to that was used and it was found in his home along with a rubber sole of Oaken's tennis shoe that was located near the TV in Garvin's home that's the piece his rubber sh- his tennis shoe is falling apart yes how in the hell and did he left that it behind? <laughs> yeah. I mean was he wearing bobos or something I, <laughs> I mean, guess so or maybe he's just worn out and he's like running like his shoes I, I don't well know. you know listen my husband wears his shoes till the end like literally and we call him his Jethro's you know from <laughs> <laughs> Beverly Hillbillies it's like yeah. got your Jethro's on today don't you well I saw okay. his brand new pair of shoes that he's got taped on <laughs> yes listen <laughs> it's Listen, my husband, and he'll use like the fluorescent, um, what with that like neon orange tape to tape his shoe together. <laughs> Lord. He's got to stand out. All right. So that was found in the garden. That was that piece of rubber that I mentioned earlier. Not to mention a witness saw him in the neighborhood trying to break into a few homes in the days prior to the murder. So there comes the day, the daytime break ins. Okay. Right, so he tried. He was tried and found guilty of murdering Garvin. And the presiding judge says, and I quote, "You are a very evil and dangerous man, and you are sentenced to death." So then he still has to stand trial for his sister-in-law. So when he was finally charged with those, he was charged with the three murders. He claimed that he was not criminally responsible by reason of insanity. I call bullshit on that one. 
and he contended that he suffered from a sexual mental disorder and substance abuse. He said that he could not remember the night that Garvin was killed, and he blamed his behavior on booze pills and sexual sadism. Is that a defense? Sexual sadism? Yeah, I don't think so. so. Yeah. Not a very good one. No, not at all. So soon, however, Stephen withdrew his claim of insanity in his sister-in-law's case and pleaded guilty in a Baltimore County Circuit Court to murdering her, uh, one of the three victims in 1987. Spree sex slayings. So he he went ahead and just pled guilty to killing his sister-in-law. Yes. And I wonder if that was just, you know, um, to spare. Well, he was already spare, sentenced to death. He's already sentenced to death. And, I mean, do you think that maybe it was to spare his family or his wife? I mean, we don't really know what their relationship was like at all. And She divorced him immediately. Well, I mean, I would do but that. was she, was, was she, like, was he sexually sadistic towards her? No, she had, like, no. No idea whatsoever. No it's like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde going yeah, on absolutely. here. absolutely. So when the judge asked Oaken... Whether he was pleading guilty because he was, gu- in fact, guilty, um, he briefly paused and, st- and stuttered yes. So he was. He he manned up on that one, at least. Mm-hmm. And I did read also where he was speaking with a psychiatrist and, like, these all the, when the memories came back, he was just, you know, devastated and I can't believe I did this, blah, 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 blah. So the judge imposed a sentence of life imprisonment and dropped the lesser charges of sexual assault and weapons violations. The prosecutors um, withdrew their petition for the death penalty in the hurt murder, his sister-in-law's murder. Um, he had already received a death sentence for the Garvin murder, and and of course there's a mandatory appeal. So he's not he's getting off with he's not going to get the death penalty for his sister-in-law's murder just for the Garvin murder. Correct. I mean. That's all. That's all it takes. But... Yeah. Right? Yes. So, and at this time, he's 29 years old. He offered no words of remorse or um, as he confessed to the killing of his wife's 43-year-old sister. So, he was not remorseful at all. No, I mean, he just uh, said, I did it. What I an mean, asshole. But if it was something that haunted him, you would think that I don't. would at for, least sound a little remorseful. I mean, this guy can't be haunted by this kind of stuff. I wouldn't think. I mean, he's just pure evil. Yes. All right, so just a little wrap-up here. On June 23rd, 1989, a sentencing wrap-up. On June 23rd, 1989, he was sentenced in Maine to life in prison for killing the motel clerk. The motel what? <laughs> the motel clerk. 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 Okay. All right. On January 25th, 1991, he was sentenced to death for Garvin's mur- slayer- slaying. And then on April 23rd, 1991, he received a life, sen- a life sentence for his sister-in-law's murder. So he's not going anywhere. So, of course, as we mentioned, with the life, or not with the life sentence, but with the death death, death penalty, there's an automatic appeal. And he actually, there's a, quite a few here. So I'm just going to kind of run down the timeline of the appeals. I have a quick question, yep. though. Okay, so he's gotten life in, in Maine. Yes. Um, and then, of course, he'll go to, he went to Maryland and had a trial for Garvin. He pled guilty to his sister-in-law. So, I guess Maine is just like, oh, well, you can keep him since he got the death penalty. So, he doesn't ever really have prison time in Maine. No, but I think wherever they sentence him, like, he has two life sentences. Regardless of where he's going to be housed, he's still, he has two life sentences and a death sentence. I wonder which state has the scariest prison s- sentence or prison system. Probably because he has death, the death penalty. He's actually he serves his time in a supermax prison. Uh huh. So do they go for the they instead of like letting him serve out like a life sentence, they're gonna go for the death penalty first. Like they're gonna they're gonna try to execute him. Yes. Do you, am I making sense with my question? Like, why is he in Maryland and not Maine? No, like, like, do they, if he got a death sentence, if he got a life sentence for this, and then he got a death sentence for this, do they just push the life sentence off to the side and go straight for the death? Yeah. Okay. 
I mean, and in the event that that, because that gets an automatic appeal, and let's just say it is appealed, he still has these life sentences. It's not going to be just got kicked out the window. He's That would be a, let's just say they would have commuted it. I wonder if he got it. any of his sexual, sexually sadistic, uh, cravings while he was in prison. I'm sure somebody did. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. Okay. All right. So in 2002, on February 6th, the Maryland Court of Appeals postponed his pending execution indefinitely as the Court of Appeal as the Court of Appeals was ruling towards a U.S. Supreme Court because there was a U.S. Supreme Court case that was pertaining not to him per se, but to um, death penalty cases saying that um, are more people inclined to get the death penalty if they kill white people and the geography of these murders. Yeah, because I think Maryland um, somebody had somebody had stated that Maryland's death penalty law was unconstitutional yes. and so that was it had gone through the Maryland Court of Appeals and then through the Supreme Court right? Right, because in 2003 on February 11th, Maryland Court of Appeals again postpones the pending execution to hear his appeal that the state's death penalty law is unconstitutional. So they're kind of riding on the coattails of somebody else's. Right. It has nothing to do with him, but somebody else is appealing the, the constitutionality of death penalty. Right. In the state of Maine or Maryland. Correct. Maryland. Okay. And I think, you know, in a bunch of other states, too, they just kind of all got in on it. But in 2004, on April 26th, Supreme Court declines to hear his appeal um, because they're like, yeah, no. Good. Fuck you. You're a sadistic bastard and this doesn't pertain to you because you're a white guy who killed white people. Right, because the whole case had to do with um, minorities are getting killed. At Correct. A, yeah. Okay. All right, so within three hours, a third death warrant is signed setting his execution for the week of June 14th. So on June 9th, the Court of Maryland Court of Appeals refuses to delay his execution. On June 15th, the U.S. District Court judge issues an indefinite stay of execution. Why? Oh, uh, indefinite stay. So that means they're not going to execute him for some reason. Right. Because of this U.S. Supreme Court case. So the... Um, I think like appeals are appeals are so confusing to me sometimes when I read these cases. And well, it's a lot of like, it's a lot of law. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, that was June fifteenth. So on June sixteenth, a federal appellate court upholds the stay. About eight hours later, a U.S. Supreme Court lifts the stay. So. So they said again, "Fuck you. This doesn't pertain to you." And on June seventeenth, the governor of Maryland denies Stephen Oaken clemency. And okay. he is executed by lethal injection, like that day. Well, good. <laughs> yeah. Good. Because he stays, when these stays are happening, those are like the week of. Like, this is like. Yeah. Because I remember there were, you know, like when you read anything about, or watch anything about like Ted Bundy. They were trying to get these stays of execution, like within days and like, you know, the, can we get a stay? I mean, it's like down to the minute. It could sometimes. be, right. Yeah. It could be just like, you know, the 11th hour, the, you know, 59th minute. Yeah. 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 Um, so this motherfucker, excuse my language, not really, had no fucking words to say. So he had no last words. No last words. Not like, you know, say la vie or, you know, sorry. hasta la vista, baby. Okay, nothing. Sorry, sorry what I did. No, his parents did a number of interviews. They were him. trying to save his life, they right? Yeah, they, they, they try to get... Son. It is, and um, you know, I want to say that I did read somewhere that like they were ostracized in their community. Like mm -hmm. nobody wanted to be associated with them, and no one wanted to help. So I know, right. you know, like my good friend who's Jewish, like they are really into social justice, and her son is, um, yeah, her son's an attorney, and you know, he's really into like making sure everybody has, um, you know, fair trials, and they're treated. They're treated right no matter who they are. And when when the Jewish community turns their back on you, I mean, there's a reason for that. So what did this guy, what was his last meal? I'm really curious to know. I know that you love to hear about their I love meals. food. You know? <laughs> well, I love food too. All right. His wasn't all that great. So his last meal was a chicken patty, little potatoes, gravy, green beans, marble cake, Milk and fruit punch. Okay, wait. It sounds like a cafeteria lunch. Uh -huh, like, it was. Uh, okay. It was the standard meal that happened. Nothing to come special. Up. Nope. 
standard meal that happened to come up in the meal rotation that day. Like, I wonder why. Did they just not grant last meals, or did they? Did he say, I just don't care? I think he just didn't care. Okay. I did read that he said he was ready to die. He was just at peace. Uh-huh. But, you know, like like you brought up, you know, he, his family was ostracized, and they tried to call in a rabbi. And I mentioned earlier he was adopted, but they obviously did do the conversion to Judaism for him. And um, so there was one that they called in that they were like members of the synagogue for like 27 years. And they were like, uh, uh-uh. we, we have, want nothing to do with this. No, look what you're look what he's done to these women. I mean, yeah, listen, I, you know, I just can't help but wonder like what genetic what role genetics played in this and. You know, what his birth, his biological parents, like, you know, who were they? And did they have any sort of, like... Like, um, what was their background? Were they right. drug addicts? Were they, you know, um, did he have alcohol syndrome? Or right. Whatever? Because when we did the, the Bloody Box of Bones, Robert Mormon, we know that he was adopted also. Mm-hmm. And his mother was was an alcoholic and a drug addict and look right. how he turned out yeah. so there you know some of that stuff is genetic that mental m- mental illness well, goes down from yeah. generation to generation and so addiction and the effects of drug abuse i'm not i mean i don't know if his biological parents were drug abusers but it just seems like these type of cases we've read enough we've talked enough about them that they seem Sometimes that's just yeah. part of the package. Listen, we, we're we starting to see patterns that we did not know existed. No, right? and I see these patterns in my day job, too. So uh, like, oh, yeah, oh. right? Yeah. I know, right? All right, so that's that's the case of Stephen Oaken in <sighs> Baltimore, Maryland. Well, thanks, Cindy. You're Appreciate welcome. it. And um, that was a good one this week. Thank you. So thanks, guys, for listening. Um, We hope you enjoyed this week's murder. We really appreciate sharing our passion with you. We thank you for your support. But we still need more support. So if you'd like to help us, please subscribe to our podcast and give us a five-star rating. While you're there, leave us a comment about absolutely anything. We want your feedback. Please. Your subscription and ratings are essential to our success. Really helps us grow as podcasters, but also helps push us up the charts. Now you can do this on your favorite platform. And for more information and links to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages, visit our website at itwasn'tmetruecrime.com. We are so grateful to spend our time together and share our murderous stories. Thank you so much for listening and supporting us. We would like to thank our Patreon supporters. They are the extra. You too can become one of our beloved patrons by signing up at patreon.com forward slash it wasn't me pod. Subscribe to our podcast and leave us a rating. And thanks again, guys. And remember, it wasn't wasn't me. me.